Hello, welcome to part two of week six lecture. Before we explore what is unique about mosque design in Southeast Asia, let's do a quick review on the history of mosque design. Um, what you see on the screen here is a diagrammatic reconstruction of the Prophet Muhammad's house. This was his house in Medina, which is located in modern day Saudi Arabia. The layout of the house is typical of the a 7th century Arabian style house. Often these uh, houses have a large courtyard. Surrounding the courtyard are long rooms uh, and these rooms are supported by columns. They line the courtyard uh, creating an enclosure. This type of layout is in opposite to uh, the Malay Kampung house, essentially. Uh, when we compare it to the Malay Kampung house that opened outwards into its surrounding, this is an enclosure. It is a house that turned inwards unto itself. Uh, this style of mosque later came to be known as the hippo style mosque, meaning many columns, uh, for the columns that line its long corridors. An example of this would be the Great Mosque of Kairouan in Tunisia, built around the 9th century. It is a large rectangular stone mosque with a hippo-style hall, meaning that it is a hall supported by lots and lots of neatly lined columns, and it looks out towards an inner courtyard. Typically, the spaces that are sheltered from the sun are features a forest of columns and these have come to define the hippo style type. Uh, another example would be the Great Mosque of Cordoba in Spain uh, built from the 8th to the 10th century. Uh, the Horseshoe Arc, uh, also called the Moorish Arc or the Keyhole Arc, is very emblematic of this type of architecture. Uh, so this takes the form of a rounded uh, or lob form, and uh, scholars have suggested that it, uh, you know, originates from uh, pre-Islamic Syria, uh, from Visigoth architecture that uh, developed around the fourth century. Uh, but it was something that was adopted by the Islamic cal Caliphate, uh, with the form appearing in a, new, a number of different mosques, including uh, ones in Cairo. Uh, Damascus in Syria, and a number of others. So it was actually during the second caliphate under the Umayyads, uh, where the leadership of the Muslim community is now located in Damascus, Syria, that the arch gained increased prominence, where it was set against a flat wall surface to really accentuate the effect of its shape. Uh, notably, as you can see here in the Great Mosque of Cordoba. Uh, and it was in the 12th century that a new form then began to emerge. Uh, and this was known as the Four-Face Iwan Mosque, with uh, the Mukarna or the honeycomb vaulting uh, emerging around the mid-10th century, taking increasing prominence as a fascinating architectural feature uh, in mosque construction from this period onwards. So what is typical of this style is the Masjid e Jame of Isfahan in Iran, uh, where the typology was introduced when the Seljuk Turks established Isfahan as their new capital, uh, even though the mosque dated to an earlier period. So what's unique is that an Iban is really a vaulted space that opens on one side to a courtyard. The Iwan developed pretty much from the pre-Islamic days of Iran where it was used in monumental and imperial architecture with a design history that can be traced all the way back to Mesopotamia around the 3rd century CE. Uh, during the Parthian period of Persia. So what is distinctive about the Iwan, uh, 
when it was adopted as a MOS architecture was its incorporation of the vaulted ceiling. Here, the vaulted ceiling is made from arches, but unlike, say, uh, the normal use of the arch, which is to create a kind of support to hold up the roof to a building, um, what happens here is that the arch is a framing device, and this frame serves to accentuate and decorate and give prominence to a recession in space. Uh, this recession in space is further given prominence uh, by the decorative detail in how the vault is con usually constructed. And this is called the Murkana. So this is the fractal-like pattern that you see on the vault. Uh, it is a very intricate ornamental design and because of its resemblance to the structure of a honeycomb with various pockets of hole that creates this very interesting flickering pattern as you behold it, that is why it is also often called the honeycomb vault. So in these two early examples of Moss architecture, I hope that you have noticed what is distinctive about uh, Moss architecture in uh, the Middle East, or the early part of the Middle East is at least, uh, it's very much based on a type of layout and planning of architecture that imagines the house as an enclosure. It looks inward rather than a self-standing uh, shelter or built structure uh, that looks out towards the world. Uh, it was only later uh, with Ottoman and um, with the Ottoman Empire conquering Constantinople and thereafter uh, renaming Istanbul, uh, renaming it as Istanbul in the 15th century, that uh, the Islamic Caliphate uh, under the Ottomans would draw from the city's Christian Byzantine past and repurpose uh, the architectural knowledge from Byzantine. Uh, especially the Hagia Sophia, uh, built in 53780, uh, which was known for its massive dome, uh, which I guess back then was a real feat of engineering. So while the bells, altars, and the various icons were and relic, relics that were ultimately, you know, uh, destroyed and the mosaics depicting Jesus, Mother Mary and all the Christian saints and angels were either plastered over or effaced. Uh, Islamic features were then introduced, but pretty much the architecture itself was retained uh, uh, and repurposed, given a new purpose. And it wasn't until 1931, after the Turkish Revolution, that uh, the Hagia Sophia was uh, converted into a museum and uh, with the recent uh, change in religious sentiment in Turkey, of course, if you have been following the news, you would also know that uh, the museum has uh, been reconverted into a mosque. Uh, so this Byzantine cultural past became a resource for uh, the Ottoman Empire. And therefore, if we continue to associate the uh, dome roof with uh, mosque architecture today, uh, we, we should always remind ourselves that it came from a history where there was a very active and concerted effort in creatively translating all the uh, architectural technologies and concepts and giving it a new profile, a new purpose uh, within Islamic culture itself. Though the dome roof mosque architecture has become close to universal today, if we were to look back at mosque architecture in this part of the world, say to some of the earliest examples uh, that we can find, uh, an example of which can be found in Palopo in the Luwu area of Sulawesi, 
there's a mosque that dates back to the 17th century, and this is the Soko Tunggal. So the mosque contains a central pillar erected in the middle of the mosque. Already, this might remind you of the Tiang Sri or the Tiang Ibu, uh, that is the central column uh, of uh, Austrian Asian house construction, right? Uh, in this case, even though this was a brick building, uh, we still see uh, design concepts and ideas that references earlier Austronesian cosmology. So let's try to unpack the mosque a little and understand what are some of its main features. So like most religious architecture, mosques are built according to certain orientation. Unlike other religions where this orientation is normally plotted along a fixed axis. Mosques are however designed so that the congregants who come together for a prayer uh, would be facing Mecca as they pray. So Mecca, of course, is located in the Middle East, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it is recognized as a holy land. It is also where the Kaaba is located. This is the rectangular shaped structure that houses a holy rock. This is a sacred site in Islam and it is an important axis where the entire universe revolves around and hence that is why every prayer should be directed towards the Kaaba uh, and more importantly uh, in Islam itself uh, a Muslim is expected to undertake uh, a pilgrimage to Mecca uh, to circumambulate or pray by walking around the Kaaba. So the direction that points towards the Kaaba is normally called the Qibla. And what helps congregants who come together in a mosque to immediately recognize uh, which is the holy direction they should pray towards. Uh, there's an architectural component within the mosque itself that tells you this. And this is called the mirab. And so in the past, occasionally mirabs come in the form of an extended pavilion that juts out from the main building itself, uh, such as the one that you see uh, in this illustration of the Sultan Mosque in Singapore uh, dated to the 19th century. Uh, normally, however, a mirab is more like a frame door uh, which uh, also functions as a tiny alcove or a recess space. It is normally markedly different from the other three walls and therefore it's easily identifiable. What you would also have noticed in this illustration is how the mosque really is quite a porous space. It doesn't actually have uh, walls that obstructs our views from outside in or inside out. Uh, in fact, its openness on some level has an engineering uh, logic behind it. Clearly, uh, it serves the purpose of ventilation, but let's not forget also the cultural dimension of a mosque. A mosque is not just a place for religious worship. Yes, there's the holy dimension to it, but more important than the holy dimension or the sacred dimension to a mosque is the social role that the mosque play. Uh, therefore, a mosque is the organizing principle of a particular town or town area. Now, uh, this is something that I've already shown you in uh, the Ruma lecture. So uh, when we zoom in a little bit to look at the mosque, the mosque is really part of a larger built environment. It functions as a site where people come together for worship. But more than that, it is also a charity center. It is a space for religious education. It is even a space for community events and business transactions. 
So therefore, a mosque is not a building. What makes a mosque is the people. This is further evidenced by the fact that when we uh, think of Islamic jurisprudence or the laws that govern and dictate uh, Islamic norms uh, and practices, how a Friday prayer mosque is normally defined is that it is a congregation that uh, must have at minimum 40 people. So how is the design of the mosque um, speaking to this social role of the mosque? Um, let's look at its tiered roof construction. Uh, typically, with the tiered roof construction here, it is normally called a tajuk. But the tiered roof construction is not exclusive to mosque architecture. In fact, it was commonly used uh, to design different types of social spaces, including deity towers of uh, Hindu uh, institutions, uh, such as those in Bali, uh, which you can see here, then takes, uh, continues to reference the Mount Meru as the cosmological axis. At the same time, the same tiered roof construction is also used to create uh, buildings such as a cockfighting pavilion. It's really a shame that we don't remember very much about cockfighting because this was a huge, huge sport in this part. It was a game of strategy. It was also a form of gambling. It was considered as uh, a type of vice as well uh, by the colonial authorities and therefore subsequently uh, it was something that was uh, discouraged. But what you see here is that the roof construction, this tiered roof construction, occupies both sacred and vernacular spaces. And its prevalence stretches back in time where we do have archaeological records in the form of temple relief panels dating back to the 13th and 14th century in East Java. And these temple reliefs do show it was already very common in the late classical architectural expression of uh, Majapahit, uh, where multi-tiered roofs uh, was a pretty unique and distinct uh, architectural feature uh, in these parts of the world. So as you can see from the Balinese, uh, temple architecture on the, the right image here, uh, the multi-tier towers are normally dedicated to specific deities and therefore are sacredly charged types of space. But they are not always religious in nature. So there are also examples uh, surviving uh, in the form of relief where uh, the tier roof construction also served the purpose of designing pavilion architecture. And these are spaces where people can gather uh, together, uh, uh, undertake social activity, uh, connect with one another uh, on a communal level. Uh, uh, in fact, we have examples that date back to the 16th century uh, where we begin to see a kind of hybridization or a desire to combine and amalgamate existing local Hindu-Buddhist architectural design, repurposing the design uh, towards mosque construction. Uh, examples uh, in, in this sense would also point to how many of these archaeological remains they, uh, are from the Majbahit period also features uh, the tiered roof construction and these are humongous towers that elevate above the ground. Clearly this lives on in the, the construction of the multi-tiered tajuk uh, with its pyramidal hip roof form uh, that then becomes prevalent uh, as a most architectural design in our part of the world. 
in drawing on this set of visual architectural references from the past, early Muslims clearly saw some form of philosophical alignment. After all, if the tiered roof construction is referencing uh, the Meru, the Mount Meru, the sacred cosmological axis on which the entire universe revolves around, could it not be said uh, of the mosque as fulfilling the similar function? After all, the mosque serves a particular community. It is the space for gathering people. It is where activities happen at a communal level. It is also a space that connects the local to the universal. In this sense, the mosque is a space that structures and regulates daily life. Uh, it is the, a system that gives order to a society and to a community, and thereby uh, it plays a very significant and important role uh, within Islamic societies uh, in Southeast Asia. Perhaps that is why it is not at all surprising if Mount Meru uh, became an important reference uh, in constructing and giving meaning to mosque architecture in this part of the world. After all, what is Mount Meru uh, but a symbol and a representative? So over time, uh, we see uh, this type of uh, here, roof construction uh, taking on uh, increasing prominence uh, across uh, different parts of Southeast Asia. And if mosques are built in every Mukim or every town district area, uh, therefore it plays a very significant role as a social, political, and religious institution not for its monumentality. Uh, ultimately, of course, a mosque still looks monumental when compared to uh, your typical residential house uh, in a neighborhood. Nevertheless, when compared to the stone architecture that have survived from the classical period, uh, such as the Borobudur or Angkor, these look underwhelming in comparison to those but in terms of scale, however, we might want to think of how a mosque is being built in almost every Mukim, uh, which is a kind of like town district. Uh, and in this replication, it is replicating social order at a more democratic scale, where what is happening here is you're trying to replicate this idea of cosmic order that historically was the preserve of either the Brahmin Hindu priests or the uh, Buddhist monks, right, who dominates and controls the interpretation. Uh, whereas in Islam, what you have is a much more democratic religion. Uh, this is where everyone is expected to participate uh, within the religious practice as equals. Uh, uh, and in that way, what it's doing here is that it is borrowing something from the past, uh, mainly this idea of stability, order, and cosmic uh, equilibrium, nevertheless making and transforming this into a concept where everyone can participate within rather than as a religious doctrine or system or philosophy that is whose interpretation and